this concept of measure for measure is such a fundamental concept. The Talmud tells us, a person who has mercy and is concerned for other human beings, God will have mercy on him. You have mercy on others, God will have mercy on you. If you don't have mercy on others, what is the basis for your worthiness to have mercy? That you, God should have mercy. God will not have mercy. Mercy means that even though really you're not deserving, as you went out of your way to accommodate somebody and to have mercy, although the man himself necessarily didn't deserve what you gave him, or the way you treated him, but you treated him kindly or generously, even though you're not worthy, God will treat you generously. That, that's a rule of thumb, the way God interacts with creation. So he says the last blessing in the Amidah is Sim Shalom. Where's God to bring peace on the world? Now, who's asking to bring peace? A person himself who's not a proponent of peace. He's not a proponent of giving others. We want charm to be seen, to be mercy, be subject to mercy. We want all this. Who's asking? You're asking that God should give mercy. And what, 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 what level of mercy do you demonstrate? You know, it's like, uh, it's known. Person needs, needs a first-class lawyer. And you get a lawyer who himself is a mafiosa. Right? He's ingenious. He can present your case no one. But when he stands before that judge and the judge sees who's representing you, you know, the, all of a sudden the judge has a scowl on his face. This is your representation. I have difficulty even looking at the man in terms of what he represents. So if you yourself, you're asking, Sim Sholom, Chaim, Bechesh, Rachman, Leinu, Klop, all this, we want bracha, mercy for your Jewish people. You know something? You're not the guy to ask. Because you're not a proponent. You're not an advocate of all that. You're an advocate and you're dedicated to it. More power to you. Hashem will, allow, will assist you to do more of the same. To facilitate it. Because you do it, you could be the facilitator to bring it about. But if you don't, as God says, you know, you're the wrong guy. They sent the wrong guy. That's what it is. I'm not talking about a person who does acts of kindness when they present themselves. There's a concept known as kolarogil chesed, meaning you're accustomed to doing it. You oh, that's that's becomes your persona. You're a man of chesed. You're a man who represents loving kindness. You're always involved in some kind of project. You're always there to help. You're always there to be concerned. Now, certain people. They don't even notice things because it's not really where their interest lies. Person finds himself, notices things where your interest lies. If your interest is not there, it falls on deaf ears. You hear the words, it doesn't mean anything. I'll tell you a story goes back many years. Before Yad of Ram was on 63rd Street, we renovated a small space on 61st Street. It was right next to the hotel. We literally abutted the hotel on Park Avenue. And it was a small room, but we did a lot of that small room for about a year and a half before we moved to 63rd Street, where we had, we renovated the brownstone. And I hear it, it's, it's during the time of Rosh Hashanah time, and I hear a knock on the door, and I open the door, she says, it's a woman, young woman, maybe in her 20s, and she's, a, she's on a bike, she's a helmet, and she has riding gear, and she's a delivery service. She's delivering some kind of letter to one of the offices in the building. And she says to me, 
what is what is this all about? She asked me, what, what, what is this all about? I said, this is a, a Jewish institution, and we try to disseminate knowledge about Judaism. She says, uh, very nice, interesting. And I close the door, and th that's it. All of a sudden I realize, how did I let her go? I should have at least gotten her name, her phone number, that I could have some follow-up. Evidently, she was a Jewish girl. She was Jewish. And def definitely, she didn't know much about Judaism. Here, I have an opportunity to, to maybe make a difference in her life. And how did I let this slip through my fingers? So immediately, what do I do? I go run downstairs and look in every direction to see if I could find where she is. Couldn't locate her. And I felt, personally, that maybe, you know, I misstepped. I overlooked something I shouldn't have overlooked. And there's a claim against me because I could have made a difference in that young woman's life and I didn't. But who thinks this way? Who thinks this way? It's only because I'm accustomed. That is my lens, the way I see things. If I see that kind of opportunity, it usually immediately resonates with me and I'm touched by it. And, and therefore I respond immediately. And that's why I felt I missed it. And I should have done it. Fast forward in the in the um, time life building. Yeah. And it's a lot of people in time life building. I'm in the elevator. And it's during Aser Samei Tshuva. Ten days between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. And a woman gets out of the elevator and she says to me, definitely a secular woman, Jew. She was a Jew, of course. She says, have an easy fast. That's what she says to me. And she goes out, and that was it. So I tried. I thought maybe the next day, I'd see her again about the same time. Never saw the woman ever again. Same thing. I felt, I felt terrible. Here, if she's telling me I have the easy fast, she's not an observant woman. And I maybe, by just even knowing who she is, taking a number, and give you some, giving us some follow-up or pointers or something. Maybe it'll make a difference in our life. Do I know? After 120 years, they'll say, you know, when you met that woman, if you would have said something, she'd be at a different place today. But because he didn't, she's not there. There's this culpability. I'm just telling the way I process things. That's the way it is. So over here is a collaborium. A person who's accustomed to do certain things it means you do it on an ongoing basis because that's where your mind is. A person who's a well-weathered businessman, when he's always, his antennas are up subconsciously. When a good deal comes, he immediately, he senses he's going to talk to that person because there's financial opportunity. Another person who works for a financial institution, although he may, that's not his forte. He doesn't do that. See, he's not accustomed. Once in a while, he may put in his own money, but he's not rogue. You have to be so-called in the, in the loop. It's not in the loop. So a person is the loop of chesed, a loop of, of being concerned for other people. God will always be concerned for you. Even though you're not worthy in your own right, but because based on the, the concept of measure for measure, God is there for you. And that's the reality. Many years ago, there was a person. This person went to Harvard. He's the same person once I once told him a story. He told me he couldn't sleep at night because he didn't know whether he has a soul or not. So he attended this class. It was a partial class on Tuesdays. It was at Shia Gold's office. And he says to me, he says, you know, I was raised by my parents. They were so negative and they were so deprecating on everything. Whatever I see, I see through that lens. Instead of seeing people positively, I see people critically. He says, how do, how do, I, how do I deal with this? It's a, it's, it's a handicap. How do you deal with it?
father, Olam Shalom, was born in 1920 in New York City. Life was not easy. And if you didn't have anybody who noticed you, you weren't noticed. And he was orphaned at the age of six in 1926. And mm. he had a very tough life. The government took away, took him away from his from his father, and he was the eldest of three children. He was put, in, put into, into a foster home, into this home, into that home. Tough. And he had really, he had the short stick of life until later. And even when I grew up, my mother, Allah was very positive. Very positive, because my grandmother was a special woman. She was also, my mother became an orphan at the age of 12, and she was the youngest of four children. But her mother was a powerhouse. She was able to move mountains, no matter what. She could take anything and turn it into money, my grandmother, Allah Shalom. People used to come to her for her counsel. And you walked in there sad, you, let, you walked out of her home happy, optimistic. That's the way she was. So my father married my mother, Allah Shalom. All of a sudden, things started to change for him. But he was also, but you know, he wasn't fully over it. When he retired, at the age of 70, people remember he used to come to the out of him every day. He used to come. He used to take the bus from the Lower East Side every day. He would open up the Yad Avram every morning. He was there before everyone else. And he saw the people of the Yad Avram. And he said to me, he says, I've never, in my life, I've never interacted with people like this. I've never exposed to these kind of people. You know, respectful for one another. It wasn't survival of the fittest. You know, it's a whole different reality. And he says, you know, it's like a breath of fresh air. And those were his, those were his words. And again, that's again, it only emphasizes the point I'm making. It's only people are the way they are because they believe that's the reality of life. When you experience something in real time and you touch by real time, you, you start changing. Once told the story about the Chavetz Chaim, there's a, there, was, there was a very special family named Twersky, the Twersky family. One was a famous psychiatrist, doctor, Hasidic family. And they themselves were of great Hasidic pedigree. What we call Yichus. And the father was a Rebbe in Milwaukee. And one brother, one was the psychiatrist. And he built a, a psychiatric hospital in Pittsburgh. The other brother was a a professor, a law professor at Harvard Law. And they were Hasidic guard. They looked like Hasidim, a beard, payas, the, the type of hat, the long coat, as, as the psychiatrist, as the law professor. And eventually he was the dean. He was a dean in law school here in New York, but he was in, he was in Harvard. And he studied as a young man in, the, in my yeshiva, near Yisrael. When I came, he wasn't there any longer. And He's still alive. He's a man probably but close to 90 years old today. And we had what we call a Malava Malka. You know, it's a special meal Saturday night. And he was invited to be the guest speaker. And he was living in New York, came to Baltimore. And it was winter, so he was able to get there at a reasonable hour, even though it was after Shabbos. And he told over a story. He grew up in Milwaukee in the 40s and the early 50s. And his father was this Hasidic rabbi. And the distance from Chicago to Milwaukee is about an hour and a half by car. So in those days, if Milwaukee wasn't much Judaism-wise, the hub of Judaism was Chicago. That was where it was. So it was like really like a, a suburb of Chicago, Milwaukee, Jewishly speaking. The Panovich Rav, Rav Yosef, Shlom, Yosef Shlom, uh, Kahneman, who was a, a genius of a man and a tremendous Talmud Chocham. He was a student of the Chafetz Chaim when he was 20 years old. And he was, he was known as the Panovich, of course, in Lithuania, there was this town called Panovich, and he was the chief rabbi. And the community was decimated by the Nazis. There wasn't one survivor out of Panovich. 
Every person part of it, there were 10,000 Jews, everyone was murdered. He was alive because he was in Israel visiting a son. But his wife, his children, they were all killed. But he, because he was not there, he survived. So when he came to, when he was in Israel, he says, he's going to build a yeshiva, one of a kind. And at one time, it was the largest yeshiva in Israel and the most successful yeshiva in Israel. Best faculty, whatever. And he built the money. The, most, the main money came from South African money. Because South African, the Jewish community, although they weren't observant, but they were very traditional, it was comprised of Lithuanian Jews. And when he came ready in the 20s to raise money for Panovich, but now this post-World War II, and he came to raise money, and many of the South African Jews were very wealthy. And they gave the money that was needed to build the yeshiva. And he kept expanding it. Mid-50s, he comes to Milwaukee. And he stays, he's at the Rabbi Tversky's home. This is the father, he's the Rebbe, Hasidic Rabbi. And he asks him, maybe you have some people I'm able to see. I'm here for the Bonfi Shiva, you can introduce me. He says, yeah, there's this traditional Jew, he's not fully observant, very wealthy man. You, you know, I'll introduce you. Spend some time, I'll get an appointment. You go to his office, and uh, maybe you'll somehow you touch him in a way, he'll become one of your supporters. This is in the early 50s, he goes to the person, he, he, the Pumshur was a very charismatic person, very charismatic. And he goes there and he sits there, calls him, tells him what he's about and what he's doing, takes out his checkbook. Zach. What, how much could he expect? $100, $180, $1,000, $5,000. He writes him a check for $25,000. So Panvich was a brilliant genius and a person he understood people like nobody understood people. So he says to the person, he thanked him, but he says, I'm like amazed. Where do you get such an appreciation for Torah? And those days, $25,000 was real money. Did you write such an enormous, such a large amount of money? You must revere Torah to such a degree, although you're not fully observant. And that's why you're writing the check, $25,000. He says, I'll tell you a story. He says, when I was 13 years old, my parents sent me to Rodden, which was the shiva of the Chavetz Chaim. Rodden was a little town. My parents were so poor, they couldn't afford to give me car fare to go to Rodden. And if I go by foot, it would take almost two weeks. And I'd have to teach a ride and a coach and this and that. But basically, I walked. So I walked from the town where I was at to Rodden. The time I arrived, my shoes were shredded. And I was soaked to the skin, shivering. I come into Rodden into the shiva at 11.30 at night. There were no dormitories in Europe. So where did the students sleep? They slept on the benches in the, in the base measures. That's where they slept. He comes in. He's shivering, wet, dirty. And he comes in. There's no place for him even to lie down. Every bench is occupied. But it's warm. Just breaks down crying. He's about 13, maybe 14 years old. And all of a sudden, an old man comes, puts his hand on the shoulder, and says, why are you crying? He didn't realize this was the Chavetz Chaim, because the Chavetz Chaim did not dress in rabbinic garb. And he says, you know, you come to my house. I'll give you a, dry, a new set of clothing, new shoes, shoes to put on. You'll be dry, and I'll give you a bed. You'll sleep in my house, in my home. So the young, he, this young boy didn't know who this was. Chavetz Chaim takes him to his house, takes him up to the attic. There's a bed in the attic. And he realized there was no indoor heating. So the attic was cold. It was the winter. And he's in dry clothing in this bed. But the cover wasn't that thick. See, literally, it was so cold he couldn't fall asleep. He was shivering. And he's lying there, but he's thankful at least he has a bed to lie in but he can't fall asleep, it's too cold. 
So all of a sudden, he hears somebody walking up the steps into the attic. And he realizes it must be his host. Must be the host. He still doesn't notice the Chofetz Chaim. When a young person walks steps, you walk one step after another. An older person, when you walk steps, every step you take, you stop at one step, then you, 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 you approach the next step. So every time you walk, there's a clump. There's a clump and a clump and a clump till you finally arrive. So this young boy realizes that this older man is coming to see how he's faring. So if the older man sees that he's not sleeping, he'll, he'll be offended because that means his hospitality is, is not sufficient. So he feigns that he's sleeping. He curls up under this thin blanket and he makes believe he's sleeping. And every step this old man takes, if you understand Yiddish a little bit, every step he takes, he says, Oi, the kint is cold. He says, Whoa, the child is cold. And he hears the chavitz, this old man feeling the pain. Whoa, the child, the child is cold. In Yiddish, he says, And every clump, again, multiple times, Whoa, the child is cold. Whoa, the child is cold. Oi, the kint is cold. And he feels the chavitz, this old man, it feels the pain. Of this, of his pain, and finally, he realizes this old man is right by his bed, and all of a sudden, there's something called the pelts. You know what a pelts is? Pelts is an English word too. Pelts. It's a it's a fur. It's made of furs. It takes this fur blanket and covers the child. At the moment he's covered, he's he has, he's he's warm. From shivering that he can't, he's and he slept. So he said, and next day he found out this was the Chafetz Chaim. So he says, it's been 25, 30 years since then. It's 1950s, maybe more. He says, I still feel the warmth of that blanket. That's why I wrote that $25,000 check. You understand? It's not an observant Jew, but he still feels the warmth. You know what that means? The child feels you feel this pain. And because you feel pain, you want to address the pain and alleviate the pain. How does it impact on that person? It's something out of the ordinary. You live with that for the rest of your life. And that's why he wrote. So because of what the Chavetz Chaim did, he, this person had the merit to write a $25,000 check, check to the largest Torah institution in Israel. Speak of Mitzvah or Mitzvah. The causality, one thing causes the other. 